the cross. Christ will meet you there. Come while he waits for you. Listen to his voice. Leave with him your care and begin life anew. there befall those who are anchored there. Kneel at the cross, at the cross. leave every care. every care. Kneel at the cross, at the cross. At the cross. Jesus will meet you there. Kneel at the cross, give your idols up. sparkling cup, trust only in his love. Kneel at the cross, leave every care. Kneel at the cross, Jesus will meet you there. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Uh, take your Bible this morning and turn, if you would, please, to Galatians chapter 6. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6. Just one verse to read together this morning, verse number 14. <clears throat> Galatians 6, verse number 14, and we'll read that verse together. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, and we'll stand and read Galatians 6, 14 together, if you would please. Galatians 6 and verse 14, ready? But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Heavenly Father, we bow before you and ask you to add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful music today. It sure has been good to hear the songs of God sung by the people of God. Thank you for the instrumentalists and the good job they do in adding to the music service. Father, it's been good to be in church this morning. And Lord, we ask you now that you'll bless the special as it's brought. And Lord, that you will prepare our hearts so we'll be ready to receive the truth from your word today. Make our hearts good ground that the word of God can fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. I pray, Lord, that you'll put our heart in tune with yours and give us all ears to hear what you would want to say to each of us this morning. And use the special to that end. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. While she's getting ready, I'm about to sing a song many of you have probably heard quite a few times. It's called The Value of One. Um, it's a very powerful song. It's probably one of my favorite songs to sing uh, just because of how powerful the song is. It doesn't, there's, no one can know how much you know, it means to one person. That's why we do what we do on Saturdays and some of you may Thursday uh, when we go out soul winning and we reach that one because that one could make the difference.
Could it be that up in heaven, God is sitting at his throne, anticipating another sinner will soon become his own? Years of wasted living and years of toil and strife are just about to be over as he receives the gift of life. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. All heaven rejoicing. That's the value of one. The Holy Spirit has been working to soften up their hearts. And all he needs is a willing servant to simply do his part. Can you imagine up in heaven the joy there'll be that day? As a sinner bows his head to pray, can't you see the Father say, Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. All heavens rejoicing, that's the value of one. Start construction on man's highway there on Hallelujah Street. We doesn't know it yet, but it's waiting for the Savior he will meet. He will meet. Go sound the horn, strike up the choir. A sinner is saved, saved from the fire. No more in darkness, he's received my son. All heavens rejoicing, that's the value of one. All heavens rejoicing, that's the value of one. Our Father, we bow before you in prayer now and we thank you, Lord, for loving us and for desiring that we have eternal life with you and so loving us that you'd send your only begotten Son into the world that he'd die on a cross for us to pay our sin debt that we might receive your gift of eternal life. Father, I'm asking you now that you would help us as we open up your word together this morning. I'm asking you, Lord, to help me to say what I ought to say and not to say what I don't need to say. I would pray that you'd help each one to listen carefully today. That our mind would not wander and be distracted. That the young people would not look at their phones or play with their phones. But they'd listen carefully today for what God might want to say to them that each of us would give you our attention for these next few minutes that we look into your word together. And may your will be accomplished, please, in each one of our lives. And I'll thank you for what you'll do. For we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the reasons, there's a lot of times, reasons that people change churches a lot of times it's sad when Christians can't get along with one another. Sometimes it's somebody in the church. Sometimes it's the preacher. Sometimes it's the song leader or the deacons. It reminds me of a story of the ships, a ship's captain who was sailing through the South Pacific and he saw smoke coming up from a little island. When he got there, he found a man that had been stranded on that island for 10 years. He talked to him and the captain noticed that there were three huts on that land, on that little island. 
And he asked the man, he said, what are these three grass huts for? And the man said, well, I live in this one. He said, and I'm a Baptist, so I go to church in that one. The captain said, well, that's good. He said, but what's that other hut for? He said, well, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> Some people can't even get along with themselves. Well, when Paul wrote this letter here to the churches of Galatia, they had some difficulty with some people who had come into the church and were being divisive. They were teaching, they were trying to add works to being saved by grace. Now the Bible makes it clear we're saved by grace. What is that? That's just the un, undeserved favor of God. That's why we're saved. Why, why did God choose to send His only begotten Son to die on a cross for you and me? There's nothing in us that says we deserve that. That's undeserved. It's just by the grace of God. When the Bible says we're saved by grace and not by works, you can't add works to grace. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. So when they came in and they were saying no, You've you got to believe in Jesus, but you also have to keep these Jewish rituals and Jewish ordinances. And they were adding to being saved by grace through faith. And so Paul writes a very strongly worded letter here by the Holy Spirit, and he's urging these Galatian believers not to stray away from grace and believing that you're saved by grace alone. When I tell you the title of the message this morning, it's called One Cross, But Three Crucifixions. And it's found in verse 14 of Galatians 6. Look at that verse with me again, will you? <clears throat> God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's the first crucifixion, the cross of Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified unto me. There's the second crucifixion. And I unto the world. There is the third crucifixion. Isaac Watts wrote a great hymn in 1692. He eventually wrote over 600 hymns. You'll see them in our hymn book. One of the songs he wrote was, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, on which the Prince of Glory died. My richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. It's based really on Galatians 6.14. Another verse says, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. But there's a verse of that song, when I survey, that didn't make it into most of our hymn books. And it's a verse that really deals particularly with this verse 14, and the three crucifixions that are mentioned. The verse says, His dying crimson like a robe spreads o'er His body on the tree. Then am I dead to all the globe, and all the globe is dead to me. And I want to look at those three crucifixions this morning on the one cross. When, I say, when we say three crucifixions, right away we think of the three crosses. Jesus on the middle one and the two thieves on the other one, but I just want us to think about the one cross that Jesus died on this morning. When we say the first crucifixion, that is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we could call that the historical crucifixion. And, and let me make sure you understand, if you, you say, I believe Jesus died on the cross, I'm glad you do, because you're believing a historical fact. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to heaven. 
There are people in hell who believe Jesus died on the cross. And dying and believing that Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the whole world. That's a good thing. I'm glad you believe that. But that won't necessarily take you to heaven. You see, you have to believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin. That He died for my sin. That's what gained me the gift of eternal life. It's the Jesus, when He died on the cross, was paying the penalty for sin. God said the wages of sin is death. That death is a word that means separation. It means to be separated from someone. That's what, that's what the word death means. That's why it's hard for us to lose a loved one, to have somebody die who we care about because we're separated from them. We cannot talk to them anymore. We can't spend any time with them anymore. And that separation hurts. And God says if we paid the wages of sin, we would be separated from Him in a place called hell. And deservedly so. Because we're guilty before God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of that sin against God would be death, would be separation from God in a place called hell. God did not want us to be separated from Him in hell. God desires that we be with Him in heaven. But God cannot overlook our sin and just let everybody go to heaven. Then God would not be just. You would not be happy if someone committed a crime against you and you went into court and that person stood there in court and he, the judge had him stand up and say, you know, you, you broke into their house and you stole this and you took this. How do you plead? And the guy says, guilty. And you say, what's the sentence for that? Well, he ought to be, it was armed robbery, he had a gun on us and he took this stuff. He ought to spend 20 years in prison. And the judge says, yeah, I know, but you know what? He's a, he's a nice guy and he really didn't mean it. And uh, I think I'll just let him loose. You would not be happy. You would not walk out of that courtroom saying, boy, justice was done today. You would say that judge is not being just. And you'd be right. Well, God is just. How do you think God's just going to let everybody go to heaven anyway? A just God can't do that. But God loves you and God loves me. And so He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. And Jesus Christ lived a perfect sinless life and yet went to the cross and He hung there and He bled and He died. For us, the Bible says. For you and me. He took our place. That's the crucifixion. He was dying not for His sins. He didn't have any. He was dying for my sins. He was dying for your sins. Every sin that you've committed, and even sins you haven't committed yet, but He knows you will. He laid all those sins on Himself. He said that day, God punished me instead of Stan Slaybaugh. He said, God punished me instead of Bob Reed. God punished me instead of Bob Wallace. You see, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. And He took your place when He died on the cross. You see, Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, if I'm going to boast about anything, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take glory in something, I'm going to glory in the cross of Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thing because in their day, the cross was only known as an instrument of pain, torture, and execution. It really was a thing of shame. Nobody, nobody would have a cross around their neck like people have today. Would not be seen. Inappropriate. In fact, crucifixion, the the, the Latin word for that is crux, C-R-U-X. We even talk about today, it, the, the crux means something important. We say, let's get to the crux of the matter. Let's get to the important thing here. What do you really want? What are you really talking about? When someone talks about excruciating pain, it literally means from the cross. Excruciating. 
Paul wasn't just boasting in any cross though. He was boasting in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't just any cross that you'd punish a criminal on. It was the cross Jesus Christ died on. He was trying to let them know, you legalistic teachers that come in and tell people they have to be circumcised to go to heaven or they have to keep some ritual to go to heaven. He says, you boast in that. You, you take pride in that. You take pride in the fact of your denomination or your religion or what you profess to be. He says, I tell you what I'll boast in. I'll boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to boast in the cross that Jesus died on. There's only one thing that you and I ought to boast about. That's not our pride. Listen, that's not who we are or what a good person I am or I go to church or I'm, I read my Bible or I have a short haircut. No, you ought to boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. The soul that sinneth, it shall surely die, the Bible said. That's why Jesus became our substitute. The Bible says... Let me read it to you in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 24. The Bible says this, 1 Peter 2.24, Who his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. Jesus, his own self, bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He was our substitute. He died for us. In a Nazi death camp in Auschwitz, Poland, 1941, several prisoners had successfully escaped. So in order to make an example, the Nazis randomly chose ten prisoners herded them into a cell where they would be starved to death. The name of a Polish Jew named Frandiskic Gasanovchek, and I probably butchered that real good, but there it is. He was called. He cried out in anguish, Wait, please, I have a wife and children. What will happen to them? But the guard ignored him. Another prisoner, Maximilian Colby, stepped forward and said, I'll take his place. Colby had been arrested for hiding Jews from the Nazis. And the soldiers grabbed Colby instead. He marched into the starvation cell and never came out alive. Several years ago, NBC interviewed the then 82-year-old friend Diskek. He cried as he told the story of Maximilian Colby. The camera followed him outside his tiny house to a carefully tended garden with a marble monument that said, In memory of Maximilian Colby, he died in my place. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did for each one of us. He died in our place. I was guilty. I deserve to die and be punished for my sin against God in hell. But Jesus Christ said, I'll take your place. I'll bear the punishment for sin so you won't have to. And my friend, if you don't accept His payment on your behalf, if you don't receive Jesus Christ by faith and say, I believe you died for me, then you will, you will take your punishment for sin yourself. God can do nothing else. That's the historical crucifixion. That's Christ paying the penalty for sin. But let me talk about the second crucifixion that's mentioned here. The second crucifixion here is by whom the world is crucified unto me. You could call that the cultural crucifixion. The culture of this world. The, and this is where, listen, the cross not only takes us and delivers us from the penalty of sin, but we also know the cross delivers us from the power of sin. 
When we talk about and when Paul writes here, the world is crucified unto me, he's not talking about the world of people or the planet itself. But he's talking about, when the Bible talks about the world, it's talking about the attitude, the philosophies, the mindset, the thinking of the world. The way the world looks at things. The way the world views things. God says, He's, he's delivered me from that. A, the, a, world, a world that is always opposed to God. James says if we want to be friends with the world, we're the enemy of God. And if we want to be the friend of God, we'll be the enemy to the world. So he posts them at, at opposites of each other. You, you can't be both. You're, it's a futile existence to try to please God and please the world. You'll never be able to do it. It's like the fellow who couldn't pick sides in the Civil War and he couldn't decide if he was north or south, so he wore the blue top and the gray pants. And you know what happened to him? Both sides shot at him. And both sides will shoot at you if you try to walk the middle. The devil is the great tempter. And what he uses oftentimes to tempt us is the things of this world. That's the carrot he dangles in front of us. He dangles it in front of our soul. Our soul is our mind, our will, our emotions. Do you understand something? When, when, we, when the Bible talks about we're, you're walking in the flesh, or, or we're yielded to the flesh, don't, don't think of the flesh as that stuff. Let me tell you what it means to... To walk in the flesh is, we're, we're made up of three parts. We're made up of spirit, soul, and body. Now, before you get saved, your spirit's dead. Or you are always sold in a body. What happens when you get born again, what happens is your spirit comes to life. God brings that spirit to life. That's what's called being born again. It's the spirit of man. It's our spirit that bears witness with God's spirit. That's why the one who's unsaved, who only has a soul and a body, that's why he has no communication with God. Because that part that communicates with God is dead. Okay? So once you get saved, that spirit comes alive. Now your spirit, soul, and body. What is your soul? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. What I think, what I want, what I feel. Now, how does a lost person live? They live by what they think, they feel, they want. If it feels good, do it. That's the world philosophy, isn't it? They say, just do what's ever in your Follow your heart. But I know that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I don't want to follow my heart. It'll lie to me. So I, I don't want it. But listen, that's when we are in the flesh. It's when our soul, what I want, what I think, what I feel, when that leads our body. And we do what the soul wants instead of following the Spirit, which listens to God's Spirit. His Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. What part of man that communicates with God is our spirit. So we have to follow the Spirit. We don't let our body listen to the soul and we do what we think, what we want. That's why the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. Wait a minute. How do we go astray? We turn everyone to his own way. Why? Doing what I think. Doing what I feel. Doing what I want. Or do I do what God thinks and what God feels and what God wants? When I do what I think, what I feel, what I want, that's the soul leading my body. That is in the flesh. That's following after the flesh. That's what the devil wants to get us to. That's what he lures us with. Trying to make the attractions of this world allure us. James says he lures us off the path by the attractions of the world. The philosophies of the world. And what Paul is saying here, 
when I realized that not only did Christ die on the cross, but the world died on the cross as far as the Christian's concerned. So I'm, listen, the world is dead to me. I don't know about you. I don't look to be around dead things. I mean, you know, we, when, when our children were little, we had a dog and we came home one, one day and the dog had been kind of sick. I think it had cancer or something. We, we came home one time and the dog waited till we got home and uh, passed away. A little dog named Oreo. Imagine that. Huh? So we, we didn't, uh, listen, the kids didn't say, hey, Oreo's dead. Let's just let him stay around for a while. You don't, you don't come home and, you know, if you, uh, you find a, a mouse in your house and you put out a little trap and they're stuck on that glue trap or something, you don't want to say, oh, we got a mouse. Let's just leave him here for a while. You don't, we don't desire to be around dead things. Okay? Well, the world here, Paul says the world is supposed to be dead to me. Doesn't, doesn't have the attraction. It doesn't pull me in anymore. The Bible says in 1 John 2 and verse 15 through 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The, I don't have to... Listen, I can be dead to the fashions and the fads and the philosophies of this world. Whether, whether this is politically correct or not, I don't worry about it. It doesn't enter my mind. Is this fashionable? That really doesn't bother me. Now, fellas, I'm going to quit preaching and get to meddling here, but you know, I, I still wear, when, when I'm on vacation and if I have a pair of shorts on, I have, I have socks, white socks. Then They're not up here to my knees, but they're down here. I don't wear the little footies, guys. <laughs> Brother Yoder, are you with me? <laughs> footies are for women to wear. Men wear socks. There you go. I don't care who you are, I'm going to preach the Bible to you, okay? Somebody, my, my kids, they get on me. Oh, Dad, come on, get with it. I don't really bother me not to be with it. <laughs> Romans 12. Romans 12, look there with me. Most of you know the verses. But look there, some of you, someone will be new to you. Romans 12. You're familiar with these. Romans 12. And, and Romans 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Notice, be not conformed to this world. And isn't that what the world wants us to do? Literally, you know, that means, conform means pressed into the mold. As much as the world says, be yourself, be an individual, they don't mean that. They mean, think like we do, look like we do, act like we do, do just what we do. We want, to, we want to press you into our mold. And the command is clear for us, don't get pressed into the mold. And we so easily do. Oh, and listen, we're not talking here. I'm not just talking about drinking, smoking, and all the things that normally you'd start ripping off and everybody, Amen, Amen! No, how about, how about the philosophy of you got to dance at your wedding? How about we got to have a toast? You see how quickly we can conform to the world? 
See, see how quickly the philosophies and the way the world views things, we look at it? Things can change so quickly. In Greek mythology, there were dangerous sea creatures called sirens. According to the mythology, they were half women and half bird. The sirens played or sang such enticing mu music that the sailors would steer toward them and die as their ships would crash on the jagged rocks. The sirens appear in two myths, Homer's Odyssey and the story of Jason and the Argonauts. When Odysseus sailed by the sirens, what he did was he filled all the sailors' ears with beeswax so they couldn't hear the music. He had his crew tie him to the mast as they sailed past the sirens. He was so tormented by the music of the sirens that he tried his best to break free and swim to shore. He was almost driven mad by the enticing music. But in the story of Jason and the Argonauts, Jason used a different strategy to avoid the call of the sirens. He had a talented musician named Orpheus. And when they sailed past the sirens, Orpheus played music on his lyre that was louder and more beautiful, so the sailors paid no attention to the music of the sirens. Do you understand the application? The world plays some beautiful music that sometimes is a temptation to us and wants to lure us away. The idea isn't to just plug your ears and say, I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, and be in torment the whole time. The difference is, fill your ears with godly things. Fill your mind with the things of God. And you know what? As I turn my eyes on Jesus and I look full in His wonderful face, the things of earth, they grow strangely dim. And they have no allure, no attraction anymore. Because I'm so attracted to what God has for me. That's what I'm looking for. And the world is dead to me. Dead. I'm listening to a new song. It's kind of like... You, you think if you go into a restaurant and... You sit down and they, they, they're getting your drink order and you notice they have the dessert menu sitting there. And, and you look at the dessert menu. And they have this, this wonderful thing here. It's, it's called Death by Chocolate. <laughs> and Danny looks at that and he says, Oh, man. Look at that chocolate. It comes with ice cream too, I hear. But we're going to have some of this. And then, you know what happens? The, they bring the bread out, maybe an appetizer, and then the salad, and then his, his uh, uh, ribeye steak comes out. Not the 8-ouncer, the 16-ouncer the, the, the comes out, okay? And he has that, and, and he, he's... Then the waitress comes around and says, would you like some dessert? And Danny says, oh... All of a sudden, he looks at that same picture, and all of a sudden, he says, I think I'd be sick if I ate that. I am so stuffed. I am so full. You know what happens? You lost your desire to have that because you're so full of something else. The full soul, the Bible says, loatheth the honeycomb. Honeycomb was a tree. But when you're filled up, you don't even want that. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. You keep filled up on Jesus. You keep filled up on the things of God. You say, the world won't have any attraction to me. I don't want anything they're offering. William MacDonald wrote this. He said, when a man's saved, the world says goodbye to him and he says goodbye to the world. 
He's spoiled as far as the world is concerned because he is no longer interested in its fleeting pleasures. The world has lost its attraction for him because he has found the one who completely satisfies. That's Jesus Christ. So that's the second crucifixion. The first one, Jesus died and paid for the penalty of my sin, historical crucifixion. The second one, the cultural crucifixion, where I have power over the allurement of the world, over the things of the world, over the, what, what we would call sin, going against God. You don't have to. I want, to be, I want that to be dead to me. But there's a third one. Not only did He say, by which the world is crucified unto me, but notice what He said, and I unto the world. I'm crucified to the world. That means I not only have the ability to have victory over the power of sin, but I don't have to practice sin. That's, that's talking about a personal crucifixion. Not only was the world dead to Paul, Paul said, I'm dead to the world. It goes both ways. As a Christian, Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. I died with Him. That means my sinful nature no longer controls me. It's not supposed to be in charge. I'm under new management. Who is the new manager? The Holy Spirit of God. He came into my life and now He tells my spirit what God wants me to do, how God wants me to think, how God wants me to live. Why do I still listen to my soul? What I think, what I feel, what I want. It's so great when it's so easy to go to prison and address prisoners and say, man, you lived under the old manager. What I think, what I feel, what I want. Now Christ's come into your life. Well, isn't it time you listen to the new manager? Hey, why would you still listen to the old manager? Where's he got you? It's easy for them to look around and say, yeah, this is where he got me. I'm ready to listen to the new manager. But there's some of you, listen, there are some men that are behind the bars in London and at Madison and at CRC that are freer than some that are in this room this morning. And they're freer because you're in the bondage of sin. And you don't have to be. You can be crucified to the world. That sinful nature doesn't any longer control me. There was a famous Nazarene evangelist named Uncle Bud Robinson. And everybody called him Uncle Bud. He lived and preached in Texas most of his ministry. And he had a, he had a speech impediment. He had a lisp when he spoke. Stuttered occasionally. But God used him to win thousands of people to Christ. One time he was invited to New York City to preach. And the host spent all day just showing him the city. Sightseeing, if you will. All the lights and wonders of the Big Apple. And that night when he got to his motel room, Uncle Bud prayed this prayer. He said, Lord, I thank Thee that Thou allowed me, the, allowed me to see all these wonders of New York. And I thank Thee that I didn't see a single thing I wanted. That's what it means to be crucified with Christ. I didn't see anything I wanted. Nothing that appealed to me. What is it? Think, you ever think about this? What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? How does that, what does that look like? We, we hear that preach, we say amen to that, and then we say, well, how do I do that? Preachers sometimes are real good at telling you to do something, but never telling you how to do it. And, and, I, and I, maybe I will illustrate it. Maybe it's a good illustration. And, 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 and when it says, listen, I am crucified with Christ. And I got to thinking, was anybody crucified with Christ? Oh. There were. There were two, two men crucified with Christ. And 
I get to thinking about that. I think we'll meet one of them in heaven. The other one, I will not meet. The one thief on the cross, as he hung there, knew his life was about the end. Really, it's, I think it's the most amazing conversion in the Bible. Because the Bible says Jesus Christ was beaten beyond human recognition. Isaiah tells us you could not have told that that was a human being up there. He'd been beaten so badly, his bones out of joint, blood everywhere. Don't, don't, don't think when you look at some picture where you know this little effeminate Jesus is hanging there with a trickle of blood coming down. That's not even close. And you may, you may have uh, seen the passion of the Christ, and I guess, and I've not seen it, it, it must have been really gory and bloody, but Hollywood can never do it justice. Never, never trust Hollywood when it comes to the things of the Bible, okay? Should, should I have to say that? But that, here's the thief, looking over at someone who is so beaten and so bloodied, you can't even tell it's a human being. And he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Are you kidding me? How, does, how do you look at that and say, that's the Lord? That, that, is, that is incredible faith to me. But he knew that was the Son of God. He knew that was Jesus dying for him. And that simple profession of faith was enough because Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. When we're crucified with Christ, we're just like that thief on the cross. You know what? He didn't care what anybody else thought about him. He didn't care what anybody else said about him. He didn't, they could have told him he's stupid. They could have told him, what are you talking to him for? They could have ridiculed him, but it didn't bother him. You know why? He was being crucified with Christ. He didn't fear the Romans getting upset with him because he's talking to Jesus. You know why? Because he's being crucified with Christ. Do you think while he's on the cross being crucified with Christ, do you think if a prostitute walked by, he would even look twice? No. I'm being crucified with Christ. Do you think if one of the Romans or some of his buddies rode up in the latest model chariot, look here man, look what we got. You think that's a temptation for him? No, I'm being crucified with Christ. You think uh, some wealthy Sadducee comes up wearing a nice velvet robe, silver buttons? Do you think he'd look down from the cross and say, hey, where can I get an outfit like that? No, why? He's crucified with Christ. That had no appeal to him whatsoever. See, when I put myself on the cross and I look at Jesus Christ and I keep my eyes on Him and I'm being crucified with Him, none of those things have an appeal to me anymore. They don't appeal. You remember when they started cleaning things up at Ground Zero after the attack on 9-11, 2001, you remember what came out of that rubble? In the beams, it had formed a perfect cross in those beams, rising out of that rubble. They've kept it, I believe, and maintain it. I think a symbol of hope for many thousands who visit that site I think the cross is God's reminder that evil cannot win. 
and evil does not win. The Romans put Jesus on the most despised symbol of the ancient world, speaking about brutality and death. But God has transformed the cross into a symbol of love and forgiveness. One songwriter said, So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. The last stanza of Isaac Watts' song was, Were the whole realm of nature mine? That were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. historical crucifixion. Jesus dying on the cross for me and for you, removing the penalty of sin forever. So you and I will never have to die and go to hell if we put our faith in what Jesus has done for us. Trust Him as our Savior. The cultural crucifixion where the world is dead to me and the personal crucifixion where I am dead to the things of the world. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. One cross, three crucifixions. Let's pray together. Father, Take the truth this morning. Thank you for this wonderful verse and the truths that are contained therein. And Lord, this morning my prayer is if there's any in this room who've never understood that Christ died for them and died for their sin, that He took their place on the cross, and that they by faith can receive Him as their Savior, that they would do so today. That it would not just be, I believe Jesus died for the sins of the world, but they would be able to say, I believe Jesus died for my sin. And I will trust Him as my Savior. And they do it today. Those who have trusted You as Savior, would they also realize that the world can be dead to them and they can be dead to the world. We are free from the power of sin. We can be free from the practice of sin. Thank you. Turn our eyes on Jesus. Let us look full in His wonderful face. And Lord, I pray that we would be dead to the things of the world. The things of this world would be dead to us as believers. And we would glory in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. 